Good afternoon, and thank you for joining us today. Uh, I'm Chris Canini, the Director of the General Services Administration's Real Property Policy Division. In July of 2018, GSA published the Federal Real Property Profile Map Tool, a geographic information system enabled map of the federal government's centralized inventory of real property. The development of this tool is a result of the Federal Asset Sales and Transfer Act and GSA's support of work on the American Broadband Initiative, the United States government's strategy that aims to speed up broadband deployment and bring faster, reliable Internet access to tens of millions of Americans who do not currently have it. The FRPP map tool includes data for the end of fiscal year 2018. Later this spring, GSA will update the map with FY 2019 data, which was recently submitted by federal landholding agencies. The data from the FRPP management system lists property under the custody and control of executive branch agencies. This interactive map also includes search and phase filter capabilities that make it easier to visualize and assess the federal government's real property holdings. GSA recognizes that by providing your organization training on this tool, you will better you will be better positioned to identify federal property that may be ideal sites for installing broadband and telecommunications infrastructure in the future, thereby aiding the current administration's goal of facilitating the acceleration, deployment, and adoption of broadband connectivity in rural America. Now I'd like to turn over the webinar to Michael Hartung of GSA's Geographic Information Systems Center of Excellence, who will be your presenter today. After Michael's presentation, we will open up the session for questions and answers. All right. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. This is Michael Hartung, and I'll be presenting today. And uh, so today we're going to talk about the, the basic layout of the FRPP map app, and then we're going to move on to navigating the map, and we're going to finish up with how to use the filters and the attribute tool, the attribute table. Right? So, and as we've said before, there will be time for questions at the end of the demo, but also put them in the comments and we'll get to that. Okay? So, first a word about uh, the data in the map. Right? So, the FRPP data is submitted by each agency in the executive branch and then compiled by GSA into the report. The reported data may contain normalization from each contributing agency based on their business needs. So these maps are not intended to be accurate to a survey grade standard. They're more for visualization and an initial uh, analysis of the data, right? So all right, with that in mind, let's get started. All right, so the FRPP map app window is divided into three separate panes. All right, there is the main map pane here on the right. There is the filter pane in the top left and then the legend pane in the bottom left. Right? In the main map, working across the top here from right to left, there is a find address or place tool, a base map gallery, a layer list, and then the zoom and home icon. All right? So starting with the find address or place tool. All right, so this tool allows you to type uh, a specific address or part of an address like a city or a zip code, and it will auto-populate as you type. Okay? So as you type in, just like a lot of web forms, it will auto-populate. To give you a list of suggestions, you can simply click on the suggestion you see or continue typing the address to get a better suggestion. And then when you select it, it will zoom in and identify that address. So uh, this tool, in addition to accepting uh, addresses and partial addresses, will also accept uh, points of interest. So 
Uh, things like place names, parks, monuments, well-known locations like that, it will also accept. So if you start going for Lincoln Memorial, it will auto-populate some suggestions. And again, same functionality. Click, and it will zoom to it and put a little pop-up with it for you. So that's a very handy feature, the place name feature. All right, so moving over to the left-hand side of the main map pane, we have the zoom and home features. So the plus sign will zoom in and the minus sign will zoom out. You could also zoom using a mouse wheel if you have the mouse wheel. And then you can also, like most web maps, you can uh, shift and then click and drag around an area and that will zoom you into that area as well. So there's a couple different ways to uh, click and zoom in there. And then in order to pan the map around, simply click and move your mouse around. Okay. So the, the uh, last thing for navigating the map interface is the home button right here, which will return you to that initial default extent. Now, uh, knowing how to pan and zoom the map is important because the app uses the extent of the view, right? So the extent of the view is whatever is visible in this main map pane to work with layers and the attribute tables and the filters. So knowing how to pan and zoom controls the results you get. Uh, so it's very important to know that. Okay, and we will cover each of those tools, the, the layer list, the attribute tables, and the filters as well. All right, so the next tool over here on the top left is the layer list. Now, the layer list is a list of all of the data views that are available in the FRPP map app. The data views are filtered or themed presentations of the larger data set. So some of them, like the master view and the status view and the broadband view, contain all of the assets reported in FRPP, and then they are symbolized in a color scheme that is in accordance with the purpose of that view. So for example, the master view contains all of the assets reported, and then it is themed by the reporting agency. Uh, some views, like the disposed view or the excess view, only contain assets that were reported in those categories, and they're, they're themed accordingly as well. Right? So in this list of layers is all the views that are available, uh, uh, they're, they're cuts of the master data set. Right? So when you scroll on this list, one of the first things you might notice is that some of the layer names are grayed out. This is because the data is not visible at the current zoom level. Right? So this is intended functionality because most of the FRPP data layers are so dense that they're not very useful at this zoom level. And additionally, drawing all of that data may cause performance issues for users with slow interconnections or slow CPUs or, or slow graphics cards. Right? So all you need to do is zoom in an area of interest, and you'll see all of the views are now darkened, which means they will turn on and off. All right, so find my mouse. All right, so let's, we'll turn on a view here. Now that it's darkened, we'll turn it on, and we'll see the view populates, and the legend populates as well. So you can also expand the little carrot next to your layer, and it will display the legend there as well. So uh, additional functionality that's in this layer tool is the ability to view these assets that you are displaying in the attribute table. Uh, so you click on the ellipses here next to your layer, and you select View in Attribute Table and the attribute table will open and populate and match the view that you've got above in your main map pane. So now this is where 
uh, panning and zooming, as we discussed earlier, come into play. The list of features in this data table are only the lists that are visible in this main map pane here. It's not the entire data set. So as you pan and zoom around, you'll have a list, uh, the table will update accordingly and you'll get either a broader or a narrower view of the data, so whatever your use is. All right, and we're going to cover the attribute table functionality in greater detail later. All right, so let's do this, this. All right, so the other two layers in the layer list op that operate a little differently are the congressional district and federal lands layers. They will display at any scale, and instead of displaying the individual FRPP assets by congressional district, it's rolled up so you have a count of assets by congressional district. So you have, you turn it on at any scale, and it will draw, and you'll get a color-themed map. The darker the color, the more assets per congressional district in there, and you can see over here on the left, and the legend is updated as well. Uh, so there's your color wrap for what's going on in the congressional district layer. And then the other layer that it operates at every zoom level is the federal lands layer. So the federal lands layer is a map of all the federally owned lands. Right? And uh, one thing to keep in mind with this layer is that uh, it's a generalized layer, which means the shapes are simplified for performance and display and this is one of the layers that's not intended to be accurate at survey grade standards. So just keep that in mind on these layers. All right. So the last icon in the map pane is the base map gallery icon. And it's this one right here next to the layer list. And clicking on that will open a menu with several different base maps in the background. And any user can select any map they feel uh, helps them communicate their message or makes sense for the work they're trying to do. So if they need an imagery layer, there are imagery layers. If they need uh, street maps, there are street map layers. It defaults to a topographic map. And then there are also a few canvas map layers, uh, like the light gray and dark gray canvas maps in there as well. So we're going to stick with the default topo map today. All right, then the last things in the main map pane are here across the bottom. We have a standard scale bar for a map, and we also have a display of the lat long. And the display of the lat long updates with your cursor. So as you move your cursor around, you can grab the lat long coordinates and use them in another tool or you can look for a region that you might have the lat-long coordinates for. Uh, another nice feature of this uh, tool is if you click on the icon next to it, which kind of looks like a crosshair, the crosshair will turn blue, and now when you click on the map, it'll place a marker, and that marker will lock the that long display to wherever you've placed that marker. So you can continue to click around the map. Uh, you can pan and zoom. Oh, excuse me. You can still pan and zoom in the map while you're working with markers. So if you need to get uh, a more finite view, you can zoom all the way in, place your marker, and retrieve the coordinates. So you can tell the status of the tool crosshair icon. If it's blue, the tool is on. And if it's white, the tool is off. And when you turn the tool off, your marker will go away. All right. And then the last feature in the map pane that we're going to discuss today is the attribute table. So the attribute table is accessible by this little arrow right here. You open it up, and it will populate. And we're going to cover the attribute table in much greater detail later. All right, so that wraps up 
the main map pane, right? So next we're going to talk briefly about the legend. The legend is a dynamic visual explanation of the symbols used on the maps. So turning on layers and applying filters will dynamically update the legend pane. Right? And you, you saw some of that when we were turning layers on and off. Um, and we'll see some more of that as we dive into filters. So if you have layers on and they're drawing, then the legends will update. So as we dive into filters, we'll see more of that activity. Right? So moving on to filters. Filters are where you refine the views of your data to meet your needs. And the filter pane is divided into a few sections. And each section affects how you interact with the view. Right? So we'll cover the use of the filter pane. But, but first, let's identify its sections. Right? So you have up top here the type of filter. So we have a standard tabular filter here. And we have a spatial query filter here. Down here, we have a list of all of the views that are accessible. Right? And then once we're working within a view, we will use the Tasks tab and the Results tab. So how to use the filters. The default filter is the standard tabular filter, right here in the top left where it says filter. Right? So we talked about zooming and how panning and zooming and the extent, the view of the main map pane interacts with the tool. So using the filter at a large scale may cause performance problems. So what you want to do is you want to go to your area of interest. And I'm going to use, you can use any of the panning and zooming techniques we talked about. I'm going to use the find address place tool. All right. So now we're down into a view and area we want to examine. And we want to do a broadband view. So we're going to come over here to the list of views in the filter pane and select broadband. Okay. And that will populate the filter widget here. So now you can come in here and pick from defined dropdowns that are in the data and run a filter. So for today, we're going to pick buildings between 0 and 30 feet. And we're going to pick a, a real property type of just buildings. And then we're going to apply this search. All right. So the map pane and the legend pane have updated. And the filter pane has switched from this tasks tab over to the results tab. There's several ways you can interact with the data now, right? So you can scroll through the list, looking at different assets. You can select an asset off the list, and the map pane will pan to that asset, and it will open the pop-up information for that asset. So the, there's a list of information in the pop-up. And the data in this list matches the data in your results pane. So you can see that data in two different places. Right? Now, from the pop-up, you can do a few more things. So if you select the ellipses down here in the bottom of the pop-up comment, you can do a few things. If you have moved your map view away, you can pan back to that asset. You can add markers, or you can view things in the attribute table. Uh, so adding a marker works very similar to the lat long tool that we looked at. There are some differences. So let's add a marker. So it will automatically add the marker to the asset that you had identified in your results list here on the left. 
and that marker will stay there. You can't move that marker. The intent of this marker is to flag that asset. So you can now turn layers on and off, run other filters, uh, and do any other operation and always come back to that marker. So if you're examining something, you can, uh, you can tag that asset, look at other layers, look at other base maps, and go back and forth and always find that asset you were looking at. Uh, to turn off that marker, simply click on it, click the ellipses, and select Remove Marker. All right, so the last thing, let me reselect my asset. The last thing in the asset pop-up is View in Attribute Table. So when you click on that, it opens up the Attribute Table. So uh, one thing to point out, in this view, the Attribute Table only contains the feature that you have highlighted, right, by, by clicking in your results list. So you can see down here in the bottom left, it says one feature. Uh, another thing about the attribute table, which again we'll, we will cover in greater detail because there's a lot in the attribute table, is while the pop-up data and the results tab data match, the attribute table data contains a list of all of the data elements that are collected. So there are significantly more data elements in the data table. The intent of the pop-up and the results tab is to provide data that should be pertinent to the broadband view, whereas the attribute table is intended to provide all of the data about the assets. All right. There. Okay, so another way to look at the data from your result is to use the ellipsis in the result pane. So if you look right here, you see there are some actions that you can take with this view as well. So in addition to uh, finding my mouse, there we go, uh, you can zoom to your results, which will return the map to the extent when you executed your filter. Right? And there are also a variety of ways that you can export the data into different formats. You can also run statistics on the results. So you can open up a window and run a statistics analysis on one of the, any of the attributes that are numbers. So we're going to pick square feet, and it immediately tells you we have 84 assets selected, and then here are the statistics on the square footage for those buildings. All right. So you can also, uh, again, view an attribute table here. And similar to the attribute table we just looked at for the one selected asset, the attribute table contains all of the data elements that are reported to FRPP. When you select the attribute table from the results list, you get all 84 features that are in your results. So the attribute table looks similar and function similar, but it starts with all of the assets, not just the selected asset. Okay. So, we will continue the workflow by clearing these results and preparing to run another filter. So to do that, you select the ellipses and you select remove this result. All right. Now you select the task tab and that returns you to the broadband view filter. So that's, that's an important step. So once you clear your results, you'll be looking at a blank result tab. You want to return to the task tab. And from here, you can change your selection criteria. You can pull any of the other values in there. You can execute a different uh, broadband view query right here, and all the functionality will be there, the pop-ups, the results tabs, and things like that. 
Uh, from here, you can also run other views. And the way you get back to that is clicking on the arrow right under the task pane, and it returns you to all the other views. And all the other views operate in a similar fashion. They present you with criteria that are pertinent to that view. You can select that criteria. You'll get a results list with all the same options, pop-ups, and uh, everything else that goes along with that, right? So that's how you execute a standard tabular filter from the default filter tool. The other filter tool is a spatial query. So here in the top of the filter pane, you select spatial query. And it will present you with the same views that you have in the tabular filter. So you just need to make sure you select the spatial query heading and then pick the view. So we'll pick another broadband view. Now, the spatial query allows you to draw a variety of shapes and return the assets from within the shape you've created. Right? You can select from here in the menu points, extents, circles, polygons, freehand shapes, and you can choose to buffer the shape if you'd like to. So for our demo today, we're going to use a point. And we're going to buffer that point with a one mile buffer. Okay. And we're going to apply this buffer and let it execute and it will pan in and zoom in to any assets that are in that buffer. Uh, so today you can see it has returned one feature. It's right here, panned in the center of the view. It's under the Lakewood label. And you can perform all of the same functionality that we just demonstrated in the tabular filter. You can select the asset in your results window. It'll highlight the asset. It'll open the pop-up for the asset. The ellipses for that pop-up have the same features. You will be able to open the attribute table. You can add markers, same functionality. And you'll have the same functionality in the ellipses from the results as well. So you'll be able to uh, zoom to your extent. You'll be able to export it in a variety of formats. You'll be able to view your attribute table and the workflow is the same to return to run another query. So you just do the remove the result, click on the task pane, and it will bring you back to the broadband view where you can draw another shape. And the entire time you're working, you can always pan and zoom the map. So if you want to come in and draw another point, you can put another point down, you can make a larger buffer, you can execute your query, you can get more results, whatever you'd care to do. And you can always pan and zoom at any stage. All right. So, let me clear that shape. And also, if you are interested in running any other filters with the spatial query, you simply select the arrow right below the task. Uh, tab, and it returns you to all of the views. And from there, you can select any view, and it will present you with criteria for those views. All right, so let's go back to the default extent. And now uh, we're going to talk about the attribute table. Right? So the attribute table right, shows all of the available elements for each asset in your view. And like we've discussed, it works in conjunction with your extent, with your map zoom. So when you zoom in and out and pan your view around here in your main map pane, your attribute table works in conjunction with that, and it works in conjunction with that and the layer list. Right? So similar to using the layer list and the filters, using the table at a large zoom can impact the performance of it, especially for users with slower connections or, or slower CPUs. 
So typically we start by the workflow like we start the other workflows by zooming into an area of, of interest. And we're going to go back into Lakewood, Colorado. All right. So now we're going to open the attribute table from the main map pane with a little arrow here at the bottom in the center. And what you'll notice is the attribute table is populated, but the map is not. What you might also notice is the Assets by Congressional District tab is the one that it defaults to. So we're going to be working, continue to work in the broadband view, so we're going to select the broadband view tab. Now, as you can see, the table is populating, but the view is not. So in order to have the view populate, come into the layer list, open it up, and simply turn on the broadband view. And now you have your assets in the map, in the extent you've selected, which includes the things behind the table, and you have those elements in the table as well. So these two views now match. Okay. Now, the attribute table itself. The attribute table itself has a bunch of tools. It has uh, your options tab here, filter by map extent, zoom to, clear selection, and refresh. So under the options tab, you have the ability to show any records that are selected, filter records, show and hide columns, and export the data to a CSV file. So we're going to start by selecting some records. So in the table itself, there are a variety of ways to select records. I'm going to make the table a little bigger. All right. So here in the header for the rows, right, not the body of the table with the data, but in the header of the rows, you see my cursor turns into the hand. Clicking in there will select a record, a single record. Move this real quick. All right. The record I have selected is now highlighted on the map with this large blue circle. So if I clear my selection, it's gone, and it's back. You can also do your standard select from a table. Uh, so you can click. You can control click to collect other assets. You can also do a control shift click to fill in the assets and select more and more assets. So all of the standard ways that you work with in other applications like Excel for selecting rows work in the table. All right, and then if you minimize the table, look at the map, you can see we have some selections up here. Uh, this one we selected earlier, and more selections down here. So it does select the attributes in the view and highlights them from the table. Okay. So, and to clear your selection, you just simply select Clear Selection. Okay. So you can also apply some filters directly from the table view. So you go into Options and select Filter, this will open up the filter tool. So the nice thing about the filter tool is that it is a wizard-driven tool and it helps you build your expressions, right? So you can build simple expressions or more complex filters with multiple criteria or different sets of criteria. And it's all wizard-driven, so it's, it's fairly straightforward. So if you're looking for something specific within this area, you can add an expression here. And we're going to look for assets by the reporting agency. So we're going to select reporting agency from the drop-down. And that drop-down is a list of all of the columns in the table. So all of the data elements in the, in the, that are reported to FRPP. So 
Um, you may or may not know what the values are in there for reporting agency. So you can click on the set input type, the gear here, and select unique. And it will populate the list. So it will populate the unique values from the reporting agency field in there. And uh, it will auto-populate as you type. And then you can just click and complete your entry. And if you hit OK, it will run a filter. So we went from roughly 309 features to 112 features. And now you can see here it removed those top couple of values that were not general services. So now all 112 assets are general services assets. So that's simple criteria. So now to return to your filter, you go back to the Options menu, select Filter, and you can see your criteria is still in there. Um, so now we can expand on this, and we'll build one that's uh, slightly more involved. Right? We're going to do a set of criteria. Now a set of criteria allows you to say um, you want all of these criteria to be true, or you want any of them to be true. So we're going to keep our criteria and only look for GSA assets, but we're going to add a few other things. So we're going to add real property type. And again, I'm going to click on the gear, select unique, and see what's available in the dropdown. All right, so I'm going to look only for buildings. Okay. Uh, I'm also going to add another one. So I want buildings, but not just any buildings. I want buildings by their utilization. I'm going to click on the gear and get my unique values. And I only want buildings that are utilized. So now I will get GSA buildings. Well, I will get GSA assets only the ones that are listed as buildings, and the buildings have to be utilized. You click OK to apply, and you can see our view is updated, our table is updated, and now we're down to 80 features. So now we've eliminated all other types of uh, unutilized buildings are no longer in this, structures are no longer in this, land is no longer in this. So whatever you're looking for, you can apply these filters and refine this data set. You, so you can start with a geographic area, collect, and then you can start refining that data set. So to remove your filters or edit your filters, go to Options, back to Filter, and you can edit them through the drop-downs. You can continue to add expressions and refine it smaller, or you can remove sets of criteria or individual criteria. So if you list three or four criteria in here just by adding expressions, they will all operate like an OR statement. So you'll get reporting agency is General Services Administration or something else that you pick. So you can come back at any time and remove any individual expression or any set of expressions to help refine. So you don't always have to go back to start to go back to scratch and restart. You can remove some things and tweak and refine. So if you have a few filters in there that are working for you and you want to refine it, just go back and edit it. So if you remove everything from there, you will get a little warning. And when you click OK, it will revert our view back. And we are back to 309 features is where we started. So that's how filters work. All right. So you can, the last couple of things, right? So as we mentioned previously, the attribute table contains all of the data elements reported. And you can customize what you see in this table. So if you don't need to see the first 10 fields or 15 fields in here, but you really do want to see some of the fields down here, you can customize these fields by dragging them around and moving them. So that's one way you can do it. So you can reorganize your fields for your view and get the fields that are important to you. Another thing you can do, and there are two ways to access this, you can go to Options, Show Hide Columns, this little plus sign right here, 
Or you can come over here to the table itself, and this little plus sign, the same icon, click on it, and they open the same tool here. So by checking and unchecking boxes, you can add columns or remove columns from your view. So I'll go over here to the left. I will add reporting agency back. And you can see it's added it to the front of the table. And if I add object IBD back, it adds it as well. So you can come in here and customize this view in a couple of different ways. Right? So the last couple of things we're going to talk about also in table functionality are you can click in the heading of the table and sort. So that'll sort your results. And the last thing we'll talk about, which is also very powerful, is exporting. So this will export everything in the table and the view, so 309 features, to a CSV, which you can open with WordPad or Notepad or Excel, however you want to work with your, with your text file. Right? If you have items selected, that export becomes selected, right? So now it will only export the assets you have selected. As you can see down here, I have two selected in my count here. So that's very powerful. So that you can export the entire data set that you return, or you can export just the few that you've identified. So if you go through and apply a filter to the table, get a subset of assets that you're interested in, you can select that subset and export just that subset of data for you. So that's how you get your data out. And then you can do whatever you want with it for analysis and things like that. So that pretty much wraps up. I know it's a lot of information. It pretty much wraps up the demo portion. So now we're going to kick back over and open it up for questions. Thank you for that excellent presentation, oh, Mike. Uh, I, before off, we jump right into the questions and answers, unmuted. I just want to take a moment to let everyone know that this is just one of a series of webinars that we plan to offer in the future. Uh, the next topic will be identifying real property based on a lease expiration date. However, a date has not been established yet. Um, we do have your email, and we'll be reaching out to everyone to let them know once we firmed up a date. Um, but on that note, uh, we'll open it up for questions and answers. So we had a series of questions that were typed into the chat box. Um, I tried to answer some um, as we went along, but there are a couple of questions, Michael Hartung, that are more um, directed to you um, as our GIS uh, subject matter expert. Um, there's a series of questions from Mary Tidlow. Are the dates for each map layer displayed? So for satellite, you'll know when it was taken. Um, okay, so the attribution for the satellite, uh, for the composite images and things like that, is all in the bottom right-hand corner. That's the source of the data. So. Um, it's not within the app because we stream all of our base maps from commercial data sources. We don't collect our own imagery and present it in this application. Um, so we, we can cross-reference in each base map. So if you open the base map gallery, uh, I will pick an imagery one. So down here it will tell you who is providing that and then we can uh, look that up and find out what the frequency of their updates are. So each base map, m most of them are compiled by the same 10 or 15 um, groups, of, groups of companies. Uh, some of them are compiled by our federal partners, uh, but each one will have down here in the bottom right-hand corner the attribution of it. So you can go find out how often they're updated, but they're not within the individual images. It's a composite map from hundreds and hundreds of sources. I hope that helps. There's a follow-up question from Mary. Um, can you bring in older maps, for instance, when a hurricane happens so that you can compare damage, overlay both the old and the new layer? Uh, not in this tool. So this tool's purpose isn't, isn't to do that kind of side-by-side -side swipe comparison. 
There are lots of tools out there that will do it. Um, and if you want to get the FRPP data into one of those other tools, you can follow those export steps that we covered there at the end with the attribute table to pull that out. That data includes uh, lat long for those assets. So any other mapping tool will allow you to import that data and then you can display it how you'd like it displayed instead of a swipe. So this specific tool was not intended to have a swipe, but there are many out there. And most importantly, if you want this data in a different tool, do that export step. Um, and then another follow-on from Mary, to build on her last question, which you just answered, and it may be the same answer, yeah. but can you display the maps and photographs as overlays with transparency, again, looking for changes over time? Yeah, same answer. The tool wasn't built for that. There's a lot out there that do that. I don't think GSA publicly publishes anything like that, but our mission insurance people have a tool that functions a little like that. But not this, since this tool doesn't do it. Um, Jeff Barlow had asked a question that I answered about FRPP data is only submitted once per year. I assume that changed asset data will only be updated annually. That is correct. Um, just to reiterate what I typed in the box, um, in case you missed it uh, during the webinar, data is submitted as of the end of each uh, fiscal year. So that's as of September 30th of each calendar year. Um, the FRPP public data set and the associated map that we're um, conducting the webinar today, those are updated in the springtime of the following calendar year. So any data such as um, cost, um, utilization, status um, that occurs after September 30th would not be reflected until that subsequent fiscal year data is reported by the agency and made available. Um, Gary Jordan asked about the implementation of the Act policy about the private sector utilizing telecommunication opportunities for federal buildings. Um, as part of an appropriations law, a uh, section of that omnibus appropriations law did reference what is called the Mobile Now Act. Um, that did require us to identify additional data elements in the FRPP for which telecommunications industry representatives could use to help identify federal property on which it submit a permit to install infrastructure. Those data elements or data fields um, were what Michael Hartung showed in the broadband view, but primarily it's the height of the asset at, or the height of the asset above mean sea level. Is this, uh, there's a question from DIFDI. Is this a publicly open web map? Uh, what DOD data is included? This is a publicly open web map. Um, because it is publicly open, DOD data is not included. Um, going back to the Federal Asset Sales and Transfer Act that I mentioned in the introduction to the webinar, there is a section of that law that does allow agencies to withhold from the public data set um, and the associated map data for reasons of national security. Therefore, DOD data is not included um, in the map. Uh, there's a follow-up question from the DISDI. Are all the views active? Yeah, uh, if that question is asking, are all the views uh, populated and able to be used the way we just demonstrated, the broadband view, the answer is yes. So if that's not the question, uh, chat or speak up and we'll try it. 
Oh, good deal. Thank you. Again, we want to thank you for your time this afternoon. Um, we do plan to make this a recurring uh, series of webinar topics. Um, next time, we will be focusing on identifying property based off of the lease expiration date with the focus for developers or landlords who might want to know out of the property in a certain geographic area what lease space is potentially coming up for either a lease renewal or a potential lease competition that may be of interest to um, that set of uh, stakeholder community. Uh, we also encourage you, if you have a particular business topic that you would like us to potentially cover in a webinar, please send an email to the email address that Michael Radney mentioned in his uh, opening comments to you. Um, that way we can continue this um, in the years to come, providing information that's useful to you. Uh, that, just to piggyback on that, that email is also available if you want to ask us uh, anything regarding FRPP data or the FRPP map at all. Uh, please use that email. I'll go through it again. Uh, FRPP at gsa.gov. F is in Frank, R is in Robert, P is in Paul, P is in Paul at gsa.gov. Thank you. All right, and I see one more one more question in here that says how from the presenter tab how to get access to the map. So there's the URL for the map that we looked at today. And it'll probably be in an email correspondence, and it's also available from your primary Federal Property Profile program page as well. Any uh, last-minute questions before we end the webinar for today? All right, again, thank you, everybody, for your time. Thank you. We appreciate the presentation today. Thank you. Thank you.